Hi, I'm Minika Raman Wilms, and you're listening to The Decibel from The Globe and Mail. For years, the Liberal government has promised to bring down greenhouse gas emissions. And federal governments before them also made climate promises. But they haven't delivered. In fact, Canada has never been able to hit its targets for emissions reduction. On Tuesday, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau unveiled the most detailed plan yet to tackle climate change. The big difference in this plan? It lays out specific targets for each economic sector to help the country reach its goal of net zero emissions by 2050. And for Canada's largest emitter, the oil and gas sector, that means a substantial cutback in the greenhouse gases it produces. This plan is probably not impossible. I think if everything goes the way it's supposed to go in here and happens quickly, then you can hit the 40% target that's been set. Adam Radwanski is a Globe feature writer and columnist focused on climate change. Adam will tell us how feasible this plan is and how the government hopes to clean up Canada's oil and gas sector without losing the industry altogether. This is The Decibel. Adam, thank you so much for being here today. Oh, thank you for having me. So to start, let's focus on the oil and gas industry, since it's the biggest producer of greenhouse gases. According to this plan from the federal government, by how much does this sector need to reduce its emissions? It would need to reduce its emissions by 42 percent from 2019 levels, which is the most recent available inventory of oil and gas emissions, by 2030. Uh, that is, I would say, incredibly ambitious, considering that it's the, one of the only couple of sectors in Canada where emissions have still gone up in recent years. So the idea of that kind of rapid reversal is certainly, I would say, a stretch goal. And Canada is still investing in oil infrastructure, though, like the infamous now Trans Mountain Pipeline is, is still happening. Won't, won't stuff like that affect our ability to hit a target laid out like that in the emissions plan? I don't think we're going to see a lot of new infrastructure for oil and gas on top of what's currently being built. And there is actually some reluctance from the oil and gas sector now to invest in new production because of concerns about long term trajectories, even though there's there's a boom going on right now. That being said, the government's plan here is not contingent on production decreases. So the plan is to roughly at least maintain current levels of production and potentially even in the short term increase it somewhat. So what it's counting on is dramatic decreases in the carbon intensity of oil and gas production. And in fact, there's a chart in the emissions reduction plan that I found maybe spoke to the challenges here, which suggests that the carbon intensity of oil and gas production in Canada, which is currently way above the global average and kind of always has been, somewhere around 2026 is suddenly going to very dramatically drop below the global average, which would then get us to our targets. That seems improbable. There are some things that will help reduce carbon intensity of oil production in Canada. But the idea that it's going to happen that dramatically speaks to the ambition that this plan hinges on. Can you just explain that a little bit for us, Adam? What what exactly is carbon intensity in this context? Carbon intensity essentially means the level of emissions from each barrel of oil produced. So in Canada, that has typically been very high, especially from the oil sands, not as much from conventional oil production, which is somewhat different. But from the oil sands, that's a very carbon intensive process in terms of, of extracting that oil. So that's been a problem and explains why Canada's emissions, probably explains why Canada's emissions are so high and haven't come down as governments have attempted to do. So this plan then doesn't mean necessarily a cut in oil and gas production, but a reduction in the emissions that are caused from extraction, I guess. Is that fair to say? That's right. Although it's possible that the production will go down, but the government's not banking on that. Interesting. Okay. Are there things that the sector could do now, like right away, to to help cut their emissions? There are a few ways to cut emissions from the oil and gas sector in the relative short term. The biggest one probably, and the most immediate one, would be curbing methane leaks um, from oil and, and also from natural gas production. You know, the technology is there. 
the government has set a very ambitious target of reducing those emissions from the sector, which are a significant chunk of its emissions, uh, by 75%. So that can happen. Um, it hasn't happened as much as you would expect yet, considering this is always portrayed by people in the industry and outside it as a low-hanging fruit of emissions reduction. Uh, but that certainly can happen. The thing that it's banking on in particular in the long run is carbon capture and storage and utilization, um, which is a technology that they're basically hoping will allow them to keep operations and just at the point of where the oil is being produced or the gas is being produced um, to capture the carbon that's, that's going into, into the atmosphere. How feasible are those technologies like carbon capture? Like, will that help the sector hit those benchmarks? There's debate about exactly how much carbon capture is going to help. It certainly will help somewhat. Uh, it hasn't really been scaled yet. Uh, there hasn't been that much investment in it yet. And what the sector is counting on is giant subsidies from the government. So in the coming budget uh, the next week, uh, there's going to be, well, certainly everybody expects there to be, a very large tax credit to support carbon capture, uh, both for the oil and gas sector and for some other industries. But it's really oil and gas that's been lobbying heavily for it. So the hope is that that's going to kickstart investment in it. It should have an impact, but most people who I've spoken to about carbon capture who are familiar with, with the technology and with the process would say that it's probably not going to have a big impact before 2028, 2029 at the earliest, just because you can't immediately scale it up. So if you're talking about 2030 targets, it has to move really, really a lightning speed in terms of what's possible to have any significant impact on hitting the targets. Hmm. So it's a bit of an optimistic outlook then. Is, is that fair to say in terms of the, what carbon capture can do here? I would, call, I would call the carbon capture expectations optimistic. I would call the oil and gas sector in general expectations optimistic. And I would probably call the entire emissions reduction plan um, optimistic. Hmm. How did the oil and gas industry react to these expectations? It's interesting because the oil and gas response was actually fairly muted to this. Uh, you know, if you look, for instance, at the uh, auto sector, uh, its response to what's expected of it in this plan, which which is essentially mandates, coming mandates uh, for how many electric vehicles it has to sell, uh, was actually quite sharply critical. The oil and gas sector kind of didn't criticize it that much. I think the reason for that is that in some ways what the government is doing here is calling the sector's bluff. Uh, if you look at uh, what oil and gas companies have said in recent years, a lot of them have said net zero emissions by 2050 targets. They've talked about how important it is to green their operations. What the government is essentially doing with these with these targets and then with coming regulated caps on oil and gas emissions is to say, okay, we're going we're gonna to make you guys walk the walk here. So it's hard for them to publicly say that's wrong. That being said, I know that they are pushing behind the scenes to try to make the coming regulations on them as loose as possible. I mean, as any industry probably would, I think what they're doing is quietly lobbying and at the same time also lobbying for heavy subsidies to, um, to help you know, reduce their emissions. Uh, but publicly, they're actually taking a reasonably cooperative kind of tone. Some people have argued that now is not the time to be placing new regulations that could restrict oil and gas production in Canada because of the war in Ukraine and, and Europe's need to get itself off of Russia's gas. Did this concern come up with the government's plan being announced this week? I don't think what's happening in Ukraine affected the way the plan was designed because it's more about somewhat longer term planning. And that's very immediate. I think it sort of cast a shadow over the entire thing. And in terms of how people have reacted to it, I do think it's, it's, it's allowed those who don't want heavy regulations of the, of the oil and gas sector that could lead to production decreases, whether intentional or not. I think it's allowed those people to maybe say now isn't the time and look, the world needs Canada's oil and so on. However, in the long run, I think to some extent, at least publicly, the oil and gas sector does recognize that if it's going to compete globally, it's going to need to significantly reduce emissions, that that is increasingly important to markets globally, that Canada is not as competitive as it should be on that front. So I think there is some recognition that needs to happen. I think the question again will be, can the regulations be done in a way where you achieve these giant reductions from improving processes and so on without actually ultimately forcing production decreases? In which case, we will hear that argument of the world is going to keep using oil for the foreseeable future. Canada wants to be you know, the last barrel of oil is the way that it's often described by, by boosters of the sector. So why are we getting in the way of that? And why are we, why are we seeding that opportunity to other countries? You are going to hear that the more stringent that the regulations are and the more there's concerns about cutting back. 
And that argument is probably hitting closer to home, too, right? Because we've seen gas prices in, in Canada go way up. Uh, inflation has, has sent them soaring recently. Could we see this plan have a further impact on, on gas prices in Canada? I don't think we're going to see this plan having an immediate impact on gas prices in Canada. Uh, but of course, it's contingent on measures that do have some price impacts, including, of course, a, a rising carbon price, which is not new, but it is the foundation of this. So in general, government is accepting that it's going to, in some cases, increase prices. Now, it's trying to it's trying to counterbalance that with, with rebates and, and tax refunds, etc. But I think there's no question that there's going to be some expensiveness built in here. You've been following this stuff for a while, Adam. How feasible would you say this government plan is? This plan is probably not impossible. Uh, I think if everything goes the way it's supposed to go in here and happens quickly, then you can hit the 40% target that's been set. The concern that I have generally is that a lot of it is contingent on regulations, new regulations. There is spending and spending you can get out the door for, for subsidizing various industries to do these things, for helping Canadians adjust the way they live. That you can do relatively quickly. The regulatory stuff, and we're talking here about capping emissions from the oil and gas sector, setting quotas for, for EV sales, uh, new regulations on methane, uh, new, a new clean electricity standard. Those take a long time to develop typically. The government tends to consult for years. Things don't move out the door fast when they're doing even one of these things. Let's talk about cars now, because transport was the sector with the second highest emissions. And part of the government's plan focuses on zero emission vehicles, which include things like electric vehicles and uh, cars with hydrogen batteries. They want 20 percent of all personal vehicle sales uh, in four years to be EVs, electric vehicles. And they want to see that rise to 60 percent by 2030. Is that achievable? In the long run, I think the EV targets are realistic. And I think that includes 100% EV sales by 2035. The other thing to keep in mind on EVs, it's a bit different from something like oil and gas in that everybody knows where this industry is going. It's obvious that we're going to be driving EVs at some point in the next 15, 20 years. This is about accelerating it. It's about how quickly can we get the EVs on the road, which is really important because the average vehicle has a, has a durability now of probably 15 to 20 years. So if you're buying a more traditional vehicle that, that runs on gasoline, now it's probably going to be on a, on a road, probably in Canada, uh, through the 2030s. And so the faster we can replace those, the more it matters to what our emissions are in every year going forward. So funnily enough, we haven't actually really talked about how carbon pricing factors into this plan. Uh, carbon pricing, of course, being the, the way that the government accounts for the cost of pollution and its effect on the climate. It's kind of the backbone of Canada's climate change strategy. So what does the emissions reduction plan say about carbon pricing? Maybe the most interesting new policy in the emissions reduction plan is around carbon pricing. It's not about what rate the government projects to continue pricing carbon. I've just been clear about that. It's supposed to rise to $170 a ton by 2030. But there's the idea in here that the government has promised to follow up on of providing a degree of certainty of carbon pricing through something called contracts for differences, which essentially is meant to guarantee to people who invest on the basis of the carbon price, this is mostly large industry, that they will get the benefits of that, regardless of whether the actual carbon price changes or not. So essentially banking on it going to the level the government says it's going to go to. That sounds very technical, but it's actually really important because one of the problems with carbon pricing and the way it's working in Canada so far is that it's hard for it to fulfill its primary purpose, which is to encourage investment in clean technology, in lower carbon solutions, because nobody is really sure if it's going to go up at the level that government says it'll go up at. I mean, even with there being some more political certainty in Ottawa now with the liberal NDP deal, which theoretically keeps this government in place to 2025, you know, you've got an opposition party in the Conservatives who are much less enthusiastic about carbon pricing, uh, who will probably at least soften it, if not get away from it entirely if they take power. And even 2025 isn't that far away. I mean, 
these are long-term investments. So companies want to know that they're going to get benefits in, in, you know, 2030 from what they're investing in at the rate the government has promised. So this idea to develop this mechanism to basically guarantee carbon pricing in the long run is actually really important because you will hear from a lot of industries, including oil and gas, interestingly, that it would be easier for them to make the investment needed to decarbonize if they knew carbon pricing was here to stay. And so just to clarify then, is it here to stay then with this new plan? Has that been locked in then? No. The certainty around carbon pricing through the Contracts for Difference has not been locked in yet. So, Adam, do corporations or or the government, do they face any penalties if they don't meet the emissions reduction benchmarks laid out in this plan? The sticks haven't really happened yet in terms of how government is going to regulate industries. What this plan does is it signals where they're going. So we know that that the government is developing oil and gas emissions caps. They have been very clear that this plan is not the cap. But if they're saying you're going to reduce oil and gas emissions by 42% this decade, you can kind of guess where the cap is going to be. There's still a lot to be worked out in terms of the technicalities of that, which I will not get into because we're going to be talking about it forever. But there, there's a lot to work out in terms of how you go about actually enforcing that and what mechanisms you use and so on. Um, you know, likewise with, with, with vehicles, they have not actually introduced the EV sales mandate yet, but they've signaled obviously what the, what, where it's going roughly. I think the message for those and other sectors is these regulations are coming, plan accordingly. And generally, I mean, even where they haven't said there's necessarily regulations coming, I think the implication is do what you can now to avoid more regulation in the future because they're obviously going to have to use sticks. So this is a real this is a real signal, and I think ideally, it causes various industries to start acting upon it now. We'll see if they do, or if they wait to actually see what's required of them. While we've been failing to do what we said we'd do when it comes to the climate for years now, climate change has continued to to wreak havoc. We've seen just in Canada in the last year deadly heat domes and, and atmospheric rivers. And scientists are are shouting at us, basically, that the time is running out. Is this plan ambitious enough in terms of Canada doing its part at at keeping global temperatures from rising 1.5 degrees Celsius? This plan is ambitious enough in the sense that the targets, I think, for each sector are ambitious enough. And it's very important that they've actually laid out sectoral targets and sort of group policies for each sector accordingly. That's something that hasn't happened previously and other climate plans in Canada, and it does actually provide more accountability and more more transparency and, again, give a signal to those industries of what's needed. That That's actually good. In terms of whether it's achievable, I mean, again, if the government does every single thing that it says it's going to do quickly, and if industries do what's expected of them, yes, you can get to these targets. But once a couple of things don't happen, the whole thing falls apart. And of course, that applies in particular to the largest emitting sectors, oil and gas and transportation. So, it can be done. There's not a lot to date to suggest that it will be done because things tend to move slowly and we have not moved at the pace we need to hit targets to date. But I guess the question is, does this kickstart everybody right now to behave differently than the way we have previously? Adam, thank you so much for speaking with us today. Thank you so much. That's it for today. I'm Manika raman Wilms. Our intern is Rose Danen. Our producers are Madeline White and Cheryl Sutherland. David Crosby edits the show. Kasia Mihailovich is our senior producer, and Angela Pachenza is our executive editor. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll talk to you next week.